on today's episode. Now, if someone were to dig out that chest filled with treasure, then you'd grow tall and strong just like your siblings, just like your cousins and nephews and nieces. And what was this awful crime? The women were not allowed to eat meat. All kinds of tales from all kinds of tellers. Here on the Appleseed. It's time for the Appleseed, where great stories can change your family's world. In each episode of the show, we bring you a couple of stories from favorite storytellers. The stories will entertain you, they'll inspire you, they'll get you thinking. They may even help your family tell your own stories. I'm Sam Payne, your host. And our first story today is from storyteller Simon Brooks. Simon is originally from England, but for the last couple of decades has lived in New Hampshire, where he rambles through the woods with his dog, taking beautiful photographs when he's not telling wonderful stories. And Simon brings us a story today about a young man who is looking for answers to questions about luck. It's an ancient story from Scandinavia, collected at the beginnings of Christianity in that area. And there's a character here called the God at the Edge of the World. No name beyond that. But Simon himself thinks that that nomenclature might refer to a hamingya, which was a guardian spirit that decided someone's luck and happiness from Norse mythology. If you've ever had a question you've burned to know the answer to, this is a story for you. If you've ever wondered if you're luckier than most, more unlucky than most, or somewhere in between, this is a story for you. Here's Simon Brooks with the story In Search of Luck, recorded live in the Appleseed Studio. This story is a story from Scandinavia. And it ends like a French story. And French stories, they just kind of stop. And you're left, like, what? What happened? And in this particular instance, it isn't like, well, that was daft. In this instance, I kind of really liked it. You'll like this, I think, sir. And uh, it's all about this, this young man who felt that he didn't have much luck. In fact, he he saw all of his friends and his family having so much luck. And yet, this man, young man, he had his own home, he had land, and he had livestock. I mean, if that's not lucky, I don't know what is, but he felt that he never had luck. He saw his family having luck, he saw his friends having luck, but he never saw it in himself. And so he went to see the wise woman of the village, because women are wiser than men, and he went to see her and spoke to her, and and she said, oh, I can't tell you whether you've had much luck or not, or whether you've had more luck than anybody else, or no luck at all. You have to go and find God at the edge of the world. God at the edge of the world? God at the edge of the world? Okay, I'll go and find God at the edge of the world. And off he left. And he traveled for a year and a day. And at the end of the year and a day, he came to this this part in the forest where the the path split and there were two branches. And the one path led to the left and and there was this, this large pack of wolves. And when he looked at these wolves, he saw that when they stood up and they flexed their muscles looking at him, and the muscles rippled underneath their healthy fur and he saw them bearing their very sharp teeth, he thought, let's have a look at this path. And he looked at this path and there was only one wolf on this particular path and this one wolf was very, very skinny. Its ribs were poking through its skin, its fur was falling out and when it rolled onto its back and yawned, he noticed that one of the teeth wobbled and he thought, I'll go down that path. But as he went past this wolf, giving it the respect and the the, the distance that it needed, the wolf looked up at him and said, Excuse me, where are you going? He he couldn't believe, uh, the talking wolf. Yes, and you're a talking person. Uh, But you're talking, how, what's, uh, I just, I was wondering where you're going. Well, um, I'm going to go and find God at the edge of the world because I I never felt that I've had much luck. And the wise woman in the village that I come from, she said that I should go and find God at the edge of the world and they'd let me know. Well, if you're going to go and see God at the edge of the world, couldn't you find out why I'm all thin and bony and my fur is falling out and my teeth are getting loose? I I suppose so, yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. And off the young man went, thinking it was a bit bizarre, talking wolf and all that. Well, he travelled further and further and further. He travelled for, how long do you think it was? A year and a day. (laughs) Travelled for a year and a day. And he came to this little cottage. And it was getting towards dusk, and he's like, I need somewhere to spend the night. So, 
And the door opened, there was this, this gorgeous young woman there. And she's like, hello. And he was like a, an eight-year-old boy. He's like, hello. <laughs> and she's like, can, can I help you with anything? He's like, well, uh, yeah, um, uh, I, I need somewhere to spend the night. I was wondering if there's an inn or something nearby. Oh, no, the nearest inn is about three miles away. And at this time of night and these roads, it's too dangerous. I have a bench in my kitchen if you want to sleep on there tonight. Oh, that would be marvelous. Are you sure that's all right? Of course it is, she said. Come on in. And so she invited him in and he went in. And they cooked supper that night and they prepared the meal and they, they ate the meal together and they looked into each other's eyes and they're like, oh, and oh. And there was a lot of that toing and froing. And then she made a bed from on the bench and she went upstairs and spent the night upstairs. And the next morning when they came down to have breakfast together, she asked him where he was going. Oh, I'm going to go and find God at the edge of the world. Well, why are you going to go and find God at the edge of the world? And he told her. And she said, could you ask God at the edge of the world a question for me too? I said, well, of course I can. Well, what do you want me to ask? Could you ask why I'm so lonely? Well, I, I certainly will. Bye, bye, toodaloo, ta-da. And that went on for quite a while. <laughs> and he traveled for a year and a day. And he came to this forest. And as he was making his way through the forest, he noticed how tall and strong these trees were. They towered above him. And then he looked down and saw this one tree, this one tree and amongst all these others that was gnarly and twisted and bent up. And as he walked past this tree, one of the branches came out and smacked him on the leg. Ow, what the whack? And the tree said, excuse me, where are you going? He says, what, talking wolf now, a talking tree? What, what is this? He's like, hello, I'm going to go and find God at the edge of the world. And why are you going to see God at the edge of the world? And he, he told the tree why he was going to go and see God at the edge of the world. And then she said, well, if you're going to find God at the edge of the world, could you ask a question for me? Well, I suppose so. What do you need? Well, you see all these marvelous trees that surround me? They are my younger siblings, my younger cousins, nephews and nieces. And yet I am so twisted and, and, and small and compared to my family. Can you find out why? Well, of course I can. Thanks awfully. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. And off he went. And after, he found God at the edge of the world. And he was very excited about this, as you can imagine. He'd been traveling for a long time. And he went up to God at the edge of the world and said, oh, I'm so excited to find you. Oh, I, I have this problem. The wise woman of the village, she, she sent me to seek you out to find out if I've had lots of luck or no luck at all or just the same luck as everybody else. And God at the edge of the world said, you've had the same luck as everybody else. No more and no less. And he said, oh, you just haven't seen your luck. When you go back home, I will make sure you see your luck more clearly. He's like, oh, thank you. He's oh, I've got three questions for you as well. I know. How do you know? I'm God at the edge of the world. Oh. <laughs> and, and so he told her the questions and she said, the answers. And he said, thank you. And he turned and left. And he traveled back. And after a year and a day, he came to that tree and he Went up to the tree, said, I, I know what's wrong with you. And the tree said, oh, that's marvelous. So, so, so did you find God at the edge? Well, I, I certainly did. And what was God at the edge? Oh, it was amazing. And then he told Tree the experience of the God at the edge of the world. And then he said, you, you, know, you know why you're stunted and so twisted and gnarled? And he said, no, that's, hopefully you've got an answer for me. I do, I do. You see, when you were a small sapling, someone came in here with this huge treasure chest filled with booty and they buried it beneath your roots and your roots got stuck in the chest, which is why you're so stunted. Now, if someone were to dig out that, chest filled with treasure, then you grow tall and strong just like your siblings, just like your cousins and nephews and nieces. Could you dig out the treasure chest? Well, I don't have a shovel. No, I got to go and find my luck. There's a shovel over there as it happens next to that stone wall. <laughs> oh no, I got, I got to go and find my luck. There's a treasure chest filled with treasure <laughs> stuck beneath my roots. I know, but and, and when somebody digs out that treasure chest, you'll grow up to be big and tall, but I have to go and find my luck. Good luck with that, said the tree. And the young man made his way on. And after a year and a day, he came to the house again. And he knocked on the door and the young woman answered. And she said, oh, you're back. Would you, do you need somewhere to, would you like to stay? And he said, if that's okay, yes, please. And so she invited him in. They cooked supper, they ate supper. And there was a lot of ooing and ahhing. And then she made the bed up on the bench for him. And she went upstairs. And the next morning, he told her about, God at the edge of the world. And she said, did, did you find out my, my issue and what, what I can do? And he said, yes. All you need to do is to find someone that you really like, who really likes you, 
and ask them to spend the rest of their life with you. And she looked at him and she said, oh, I really like you. And he said, I really like you. Would you spend the rest of your life with me? I've got to go and find my luck first. <laughs> okay, she said. I'll come back there afterwards. Okay, I suppose so, she said. Goodbye, she said, and bye-bye, he said. And that was it. And he traveled for a year and a day. And he came to the wolf. And the wolf was still there, still skinny, still with hair falling out, ribs poking through. And the wolf looked at him and said, you, you, you made it. You, you, you saw God at the edge of the world. He said, I did. I saw God at the edge of the world. And it was amazing. Well, tell me all about it. Tell me about it. And so the young man told the wolf about his adventures and, and the, the cottage and the woman and then the tree and the treasure. And then, whoa, that's it. And you, you didn't dig the treasure up? No, no, no. I was too busy. I've got to find my luck. Okay. And you didn't stay with the young woman either? No, no, no. I was too busy looking for my luck. All right, then. So uh, what did God at the edge of the world say about me? Well, God at the edge of the world said you to eat the first foolish person to come along. <laughs> and so the wolf ate the young man and grew strong and healthy. And because of that, lived happily ever after. <laughs> Simon Brooks with a story called In Search of Luck, a story recorded live in the Appleseed studio before our terrific studio audience. You know, when I think about the quest undertaken by the unfortunate hero of Simon's story, I think of the sort of quest on which I find myself when I've got big questions that seem to need answers. And while I've never found myself trekking to the edge of the world to speak to a hamingya, I do try to make time to go to the quiet places in my heart as often as I can, or in thoughtful conversation with people I trust, or as a person of faith, even to prayer and spiritual contemplation. Like the guy in the story, I find myself coming out of some of those interactions with some good advice. Understanding it and putting into practice, of course, is sometimes a challenge, but the quest continues, and I'm glad I have help and that I haven't been devoured by wolves yet, anyway. In a way that happens sometimes with stories, Simon's story has me thinking about my own life as a quest and thinking about some of the people who have been important to that quest over the years. You know, we always hope that the stories that we bring you spark memories and thoughts for you that you can share with the people that you love as stories. And I bet some memories sprang to mind from you, from your life or the life of someone you know. Stories have this wonderful way of sprouting like seeds and growing as the stories bring up thoughts that grow into conversations. Maybe that's why we call the show The Apple Seed. Coming up, Mara Menzies with a story from Kenya. On the apple seed, I'm Sam Payne. It's a pleasure to be with you on the apple seed. A moment ago, we heard In Search of Luck, a story from storyteller Simon Brooks about learning to recognize the luck, the good fortune we all have available to us. Sometimes we walk right by it without seeing it at all. And we have another ancient story today, this time from Kenyan Scottish storyteller Mara Menzies from the Gikuyu people in Kenya. This story asks the question, how do traditions become traditions? And it also contemplates the idea of how traditions change over time as the needs of a community change. It's a story filled with questions asked by one curious cook in the kitchen. Here's a performance of Washu and the Forbidden Meat, recorded live in the Appleseed Studio. So I'm going to tell uh, another story. And this story is actually from Kenya. And it's, uh, it's one of the first stories that I ever learned as a professional storyteller. And it's a story from the Gikuyu people of Kenya. In Kenya, we have 44 different ethnic groups. So these are 44 different languages, many customs, traditions, beliefs, all are different. And the Gikuyu are the largest ethnic group in Kenya. 
And this is also an old story. It's a story about a woman and her name was Washu. What was her name? Washu. Washu was loved by everybody in her village. She was kind. She was hardworking. If anybody needed any help, Washu was the first to volunteer. She loved to sing and dance. And people thought she was just so kind and compassionate. And Washu was married to a man whose name was Kamau. What was his name? Kamau. And Kamau was an elder. He was one of the elders and he had much wealth, many herds and herds of cattle. And so because of his position, his status in the community, because of all of these herds of cattle, he had several wives and many, 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 many children. But he was a good man, a kind and fair man. And he made sure that all his family was very well taken care of. But as I said, this is an old story. And it takes place at a time when there was a particular tradition in the community. Something that the women were not allowed to do. And if the woman was caught doing this one thing, she would be punished and her husband would be punished too. And what was this awful crime? The women were not allowed to eat meat. Now, I don't know if we have any vegetarians in here. Apologies if you are a vegetarian. This is not a vegetarian story. Now, Washu and all the other women, they had many jobs to do. And of course, one of those jobs involved the cooking of the meat. Whenever there was a harvest, whenever the rains fell, whenever a child was born, whenever somebody passed away, whenever there was a wedding, a reason to celebrate, a cow was slaughtered and the women would busy themselves preparing a feast. And then once the meat was ready, they would serve it to their uncles, they would serve it to their grandfathers, they would serve it to their husbands, but not a single morsel would ever pass their lips. And nobody cared. Nobody minded. This tradition had existed for such a long time that nobody thought about it anymore. It was just something the women did not do. Now, one day, a new tiny little baby, googly, 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 had been born into the village. And of course, a celebration was held to welcome this new soul and to bring blessings and all the contributions that this tiny new person would bring to the community. And so Washu was there with all the other women and they were busy cutting and roasting and boiling. And they too were telling stories. Can I hear the sound of lots of women in one area cooking and chattering? Oh, it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to get the latest gossip, to tell all the terrible things that had happened, all the wonderful things that had gone on, any juicy love stories that were taking place. When suddenly, all the women had something else to do and Washu was left alone. And you know, when you're on your own, that's when your mind begins to wander. Yeah, you begin to think of all those things you shouldn't really be thinking about. And Washu began to wonder what that meat tasted like. She was shocked, shocked at the audacity. How could she even think such a thing? But of course, once a seed is planted, it has to grow. And her curiosity grew and grew until she couldn't resist anymore. She looked around and nobody was watching. She picked up a knife and whoosh, she cut a tiny sliver of meat and mm, 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 mm. it was so good. And she thought, why? Why are the women not allowed to eat this meat? But she knew the law and she did not want to get into trouble. So she decided to just keep it her own little secret. But whenever the meat was being cooked, Washu would always make sure that whoosh, she would find a little piece. Now the months rolled by and Washu was enjoying this guilty little secret. When one day there was the passing of an elder and there was a, a great feast to honor all the contributions that this person had made. And Washu, she found her moment. She chopped off a nice big juicy fatty tasty piece of meat. She was loving it when suddenly she could hear footsteps approaching. And <laughs> she chewed and chewed, but suddenly the door opened and there was Kamau. Habari aleo, Washu. <laughs> now Kamau soon discovered that his wife was eating meat. And was he happy? 
No! Washu, how can you do such a thing? How you know what's going to happen? You'll be punished? I will be punished? Don't you care about our family? Don't you respect our traditions? And Washu felt terrible because she did respect her husband. She did respect the law. But she asked him, why, why can the women not eat meat? But Kamal was so annoyed, he didn't want to speak to her at all. And so she thought, well, I don't want to get into trouble, so maybe I will try and stop eating the meat. And so she did. Oh, the weeks and the months went by, and she was taking such great care until... There was the harvest, and there she was in the cooking area with all the other women, when without even thinking about it, whoosh, she sliced off a piece. Mm, 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 mm. Ah, she had been seen, and Washu was dragged before the elders, and the elders were not happy. Washu, why are you eating meat? <gasps> well, um, there are so many reasons, but I just don't understand why the women are not allowed to eat meat. Washu, do you think that our forefathers are wrong when they made this tradition? No, it's not that. Washu, this is serious. Where is your husband? And they brought Kamau. And there was Kamau. Kamau, did you know that your wife was eating meat? Yes, I knew. Oh, come out. We pity you, our brother. Your wife is a terrible, wicked woman. If all the women find out that she is eating meat, they'll all want to do it. Is this what you want? <gasps> no, of course not. Come out. Your wife will contaminate the minds of everybody here. However, you are one of the elders. So we're just going to let you off with a warning. But please do not let this happen again. You are dismissed. And the two of them went home. And there was trouble that night. Well, Washu, she still tried to find out why can we not eat meat? But Kamau had been humiliated in front of his friends and his peers. He didn't want to look at Washu. He certainly didn't want to speak to her. And so Washu thought, this is getting really, really serious. If I stop cooking, yes, if I stop cooking, I won't be tempted to eat the meat and everything will be just fine. And that's what she did. A whole year went by and she had almost forgotten what the taste of meat was like. And then the chief announced that his beautiful daughter was going to marry the son of the chief from the next village. And this was wonderful news. It meant the villagers would be united. They would be stronger. They would be more prosperous. And so the biggest feast in the region was announced and everybody's help was needed, including who? Washu. Oh, no. Please, I don't want to cook. It's a really bad idea. But there she was in the cooking area, surrounded by this wonderful aroma of roast meat, like sausages sizzling, summer barbecues. Ah, oh, you know that smell. Oh, and she thought, why? Why can the women not eat meat? Hmm. Why? Why can the women not eat meat? I am going to eat the meat. And so she took her knife and whoosh, she chopped off a piece and mm, mm, mm. Ah, she was dragged before the elders once more. Washu, this is the second time you are here for the same crime. Why do you continue to eat the meat? Oh, I tried to stop, but then I was surrounded and then I began to wonder, Washu. This is terrible. You have been warned once. You are now going to be punished. You are banished. You are not allowed to see your husband or your friends or your children or all your sisters for one whole year. You are alone. But, but, go, go, they said. And of course, Kamau was there. Kamau, this is terrible. We have to get rid of your wife. She is a danger to this community. You must also be punished. You will go out into your fields. You will choose your juiciest, tastiest cow. You will slaughter that cow with your own hands. Don't let your sons do it. And then your wives will prepare a feast and all of the men will enjoy your property and you will watch us, but you cannot join us. Kamau agreed. And he went out, he slaughtered the cow, his wives were preparing a feast, they were roasting the meat, wrapping it in banana leaf to keep it nice and fresh, and putting it to one side. Roasting it, wrapping it, and putting it to one side. And uh, can you give me the laugh of a hungry man? Can I hear that? 
<laughs> they were so excited at this unexpected feast when suddenly, out of nowhere, whoosh, an eagle flew down and it seized the biggest piece of meat and whoosh, off it went. The men were outraged. Get that eagle, chase that meat. What did they say? Get that eagle, chase that meat. And they started to run after that eagle. But the eagle was fast, flying higher and further. And then suddenly they saw the eagle drop the meat. And this was serious. There are hyenas out there, wild dogs, leopards. And oh, they knew that that meat was gone. And so they raced as fast as they could when suddenly <gasps> they stopped in their tracks. They could not believe their eyes because there in front of them was Washu. And she was so upset. I have been banished. She prayed to the heavens, please help me. All I did was eat a piece of meat. And as if to answer her prayers, the heavens opened and bah, something fell from the sky wrapped in a banana leaf. And when she opened it, what was it? A piece of meat. She sliced a piece, she ate it, and it was so delicious. Can I hear some nice foodie sounds? Mm, mm, mm. Oh. And when the men saw this, they thought it must be a sign from God. And so they agreed that all the Gikuyu women were now allowed to eat meat. <laughs> That was Mara Menzies with Washu and the Forbidden Meat. Thanks for joining us today on The Apple Seed, and thanks to Simon Brooks and Mara Menzies for sharing their stories. Listening to these stories always brings up memories for me that I like to share. Where did the stories take you, and who will you take along? Our episode today was produced by Brian Tanner and Heather Bigley. Our audio engineer is Carly Wilson. Trent Horton, Natalia Reeve, Hannah Harlan, and Evie Hendricks make up the rest of the Appleseed team. If you want to send us a note, you can email us at theappleseed at byu.edu. That's theappleseed, all one word, at byu.edu. Or if you're listening through a podcast app, rate us. Leave us a little review. It helps people find the show. And if you're in the mood for more storytelling, you can find our brand new podcast, Kaboom, it's called, and it's full of audio adventures for the whole family. Sci-fi, fantasy, gadgety spy adventures, westerns, even the occasional musical if we're feeling up to it. That's Kaboom, K-A-B-O-O-M. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. We're pleased and proud to be among the many shows in the BYU Radio family of programs, and you can find this episode or any episode from our archive on the BYU Radio app at byuradio.org slash Appleseed or by Googling the Appleseed podcast. I'm Sam Payne, and I can't wait to be with you again on the Appleseed. Appleseed.